just another day talking about Artemis Fowl. <laughs> hey yo, uh, I'm just your average boy, bookworm, who really likes talking about how bad the Artemis Fowl movie is. If this happens to be your first video on this channel for some reason, hi, I've made two other videos covering this topic of uh, just how bad the adaption is. Uh, go, go read the books. The movie sucks. Yeah. Okay. Bye. <laughs> These last two videos were about the Fowl family and the Butler family. So this one's going to go over the fairies in the Ultimus Fowl universe how badly the movie screwed them up like oh my god is it really that hard is it really that hard apparently it is but just like in the last video a quick rundown of the production history uh 2001 a movie was announced years passed 2013 disney acquires the rights and in 2017 disney says hey we're gonna be uh making the movie now, the adaption's coming out, 2018 is when they start filming, and then in 2019, the same year it's supposed to release, I'm like, hey, we have to push it back, we have to push it back until um, 2020, and that's where we're at today. Oh boy. Yeah, this was a mm, pretty, pretty rocky production history, not gonna lie, it's not it's not going good for them took 19 years in the making and let's see what those 19 years ended up paying off with uh to start this off i can't go into talking about the characters without first talking about like what is a fairy because the movie doesn't actually tell you what a fairy is and yeah it's kind of disappointing fairies is not actually a specific like race of people, it's a general term used for the people. These are elves, dwarves, centaurs, pixies, sprites, gnomes, goblins, and trolls. And if you read the fifth book, the fifth book, you know there's an extra house there. But spoilers, go read the books. And the movie doesn't establish this at all. You know, it makes sense. We learned this through a narrator. And oh, wait, this movie does have a narrator. Where wasn't it explained? Also, a lot of this movie is explained. Um, it explains the fairy lore through Autumn's Fowl Senior telling it to Junior. So, um, why wasn't one of those scenes maybe explaining this? Because if there is, I sure don't remember. And I watched this movie twice. So, if they did any kind of explaining as to what a fairy is, they did a terrible job. As somebody who watched this movie t twice. Still cannot remember where they explained any of this. The fairies also live by something called the book. The book? What is that, you might ask, uh, if you've only read the movie? Read the movie? Wow. <laughs> you know, my subconscious just keeps saying, go read the books. Uh, the book is essentially their Bible. They must abide by these rules or they could lose their magic. And... These rules are very, very important throughout the entirety of the series. Uh, the two most prominent rules you're going to hear throughout the entire series is that a fairy uh, cannot enter the home of a human without the permission of the inha inhabitants. And once in the home, they must follow the orders given to them by the human inhabitant. Yeah, these are the two most important rules. They do establish these rules in the movie but it's very weird as to how he finds out about these rules because they actually deleted the scene where he gets a hold of the fairy book instead he like somehow has this information through his do his dad's computer like decoding something it's very very weird so it's like it's a little hard to understand but at least they do go over the rules and i guess they have to because they do have that one scene where commander root goes into the house so should you break this rule, say you enter a home uninvited, you lose all the magic that's in your system, and you're hit with a sickness that makes you like very, very nauseous, very dizzy, like you you are like in no way going to be able to like stand your ground in that home. Like you're gonna be at like, the complete mercy of whoever's in there. Then you would have to do the ritual, uh, 
to regain your magic. It's this thing where you go to an ancient oak tree at the bend of a river, you pick an acorn under a full moon, and you bury it somewhere else. And when you bury it, the earth refills your magic. Should you enter home enough time or break the other rules enough times, even during the ritual, you will not get your magic back. You have lost all your magic. That last part about losing your magic, breaking the rules, that isn't explained in the movie. And it's actually a big part of the series and a big part of this very first book, and it's not. So I do not understand why they cut that out, as it's very integral to the fairies and understand these fairies. Uh, and that's not a bit of this is that magic cannot be blocked. They have a scene in the movie where they block Hani's magic, which cannot happen as the magic is this sort of, it's an energy source that's inside them. You can't jam her magic. They made it sound as if her magic is maybe like in the suit she wears because she has some flashy knight that told her she had magic or not and that's given through her through like the technology. No, that's not possible. The only way for you to lose your magic is if you were to run out of it because you can run out of magic and like you expended all your energy, then you have to do the ritual again. You break a rule and your magic like leaves your system. Uh, or those, uh, I forgot what it is. It happens in a few books, but it's, uh, was it like rendered fat or something? If you get dunked in it, your magic gets sapped out of you or something? I don't remember. I think it was something like that. I haven't read the last few books in the series in a few years so i'm forgetting the exact thing it is um but yeah obviously you can't just nip a switch and her magic is blocked i'm pretty sure they only did this to make um that one scene i talked about in the nas video of like but no almost dying a bit more of a, like a fake out death thing like they're like oh wait she has magic during this scene because we changed the reason of her going to the oak tree how are we gonna make it seem like Button is actually gonna die when we've established that she can heal? It just it just comes off as bad writing. They're like, oh, we wrote ourselves into a corner here by not following the original story nine. How do we make this scene impactful? Let's change the magic system. I'm also thinking of adding like a fifth video to this series where I actually explain the entire magic system they have. Because as I was, I was writing about the fairies, I realized that there was no way I could talk about all the magic system and all the characters, like, yeah, that's not gonna happen. But I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what fairies are because it was not explained in the movie. So yeah, let's jump into the first character I'm gonna talk about, which is Officer Honey Short. Now, Honey is an elf. She is also the first female officer of the LNP Recon. That is Noah Eneman's Panice Reconnaissance. Neprecon. Heh, <laughs> get it? get it it's kind of funny there the suits are even green and stuff and you know she's um kind of a badass she's known to be a pretty sharpshooter she's not one to miss her shots like at all she has some really insane shooting in some of the books like it's pretty cool uh she's also supposed to be one of the best flyers in the nap recon she's super smart on her feet she's very quick to come up with a plan uh, she might be a little hot-headed when she like jumps into action, but once she's in the fight, she's like, okay, this is what I gotta do. Ooh, there's this one like pipe going over us. If I shoot that thing, it's gonna like let the cooling agent come out, and then that's gonna like disrupt the enemy. And you know, she's she's very tactical like that. And despite all this, you know, she has to deal with sexism from her fellow officers, because like I said, she's the first female officer of the NAP recon. And this is like a big, big part of her character is just dealing with the sexism in any part of her work knife. She knows that she's under a microscope. Um, it doesn't really hit her how much under a microscope she is until later. But she knows that anything she does will be criticized. Say she's five seconds late. The canon is like, oh, what are you doing short being five seconds late? Well, like some other... Some other officers are coming in like five minutes late. Like little things like that. She has to work through it. And she really has to prove herself. She knows the council is not on her side. From what I've gathered reading the book, so seems to be only one woman on the council, uh, which is the wing commander, who she almost uh, hit with uh, her shuttle when she was practicing flying. 
You know how I said she's one of the best flyers? Apparently back in her training days, the wing commander made this joke that she could fly a shuttle through your teeth because she almost got hit in the teeth with a shuttle from Holly. <laughs> oh, it's pretty funny. And yeah, like, it's, I feel like it's a very interesting thing to put into a novel that's meant for like kids and teenagers is showing this woman go through the sexism in the workforce because you know some kids are gonna are gonna relate to that like hey that was probably one of the first things i read well sexism was lengthening right in front of me and i was being like yeah this is a bad thing it's bad that she's treated this way she's obviously shown that she is just as capable as the rest of the officers yet she's scrutinized and it's nice that it's so blatantly obvious to everybody that hey sexism is not okay it's and it's nice it's nice to have that message to kids i don't know why it was removed in the movie because in the movie all of that is stripped from her she's no longer this like badass officer who can kick all this butt and you don't want to meet in an anyway cause doing some kind of inigo activity because she, she, she'll, she'll catch you. She's now a baby child. There's a scene where she wants to go to the surface and be part of the rest of the other squads that are out for work. And apparently she's the only one who's left behind. And the commander's like, oh, you're so young. Like, you'll get your time. Like, no. At this point, she's had like... 10 operations done i think she's only one of them was like semi unsuccessful but they still caught the guy at the end like she so technically she has had 10 operations under her belt that she succeeded in like why is she being babied why are we giving this babied child as honey they also pan over like the rest of the officers so you can clearly see the other women there and there's also now a woman commander so they're like what's the sexism aspect what is like what is her conflict now since she doesn't have to fight against sexism oh it's because everybody thinks her dad is a traitor and like she's kind of like trying to bring honor back to her family and show that she like her dad wasn't actually a bad guy and that she's not a bad guy because everybody kind of thinks that she's also gonna go rogue like her dad and it's like why did you change it to something like that? Like, anybody's family can go rogue and turn traitorous and stuff. What kind of message is that sending? Like, before you had this message about, like, hey, sexism is bad. And now it's that, like, yeah, like, maybe don't think this person's a traitor right away. I, I don't know. I don't know what message her, her struggles are supposed to show. And because they made her all baby, like, she, they're like, oh, yeah, like, She's not this, like, accomplished flyer anymore or sharpshooter or anything because apparently she's being sent off on her first mission or something because she's never been to the surface. But, like, the whole point of the recon is, like, you, like, track down the people who are, like, trying to, like, do illegal stuff with the surface. And, like, you're the one who, like, stabilizes the situation until um, retrieval comes to clean it up and stuff. Why? why did that they, they changed that about her like when you see her fighting for the first time in the movie it's very very comical like i don't get any feeling of this person being like a trained professional who has spent years proving herself like in casting her as like a 14 year old and saying she's like 84 year old like i always i always just like pictured holly to be between like 19 and 21 physically in like in a, like nooking because fairies age are not snower than humans she was in her 80s throughout the entire series uh commander rude was like 400 and something i believe mulch was also like 400 and something yeah a lot of these a lot of the fairies you meet are like in the hundreds but they like i guess to get around the whole like oh they're super short let's cast children in these roles i'm like no now it just looks like this kid is fighting the cgi troll and it doesn't look badass at all and then like the last issue i have with her casting not only is she a 14 year old child she's also a white child when she is specifically described at the very very start when when she appears in the book to have nut brown skin 
I actually want to read out exactly how she is described. Honey Short had nut-brown skin, cropped auburn hair, and hazel eyes. Her nose had a hook, and her mouth was plump and cherubic, which was appropriate considering Cupid was her great-grandfather. That is the description she has on Kindle. This is page 42. By the way, Artemis Fell is free on Kindle if you want to go read it. I highly suggest you do. So tell me why, when that is her description... They cast a white actress. Like, did they want to, like, do a white actress because, like, they're trying to tie in with the whole island stuff? Like, what was the point of that? So, I just opened up the wiki real quick to double check in case there was something from the behind the scenes that I might have missed as I did not watch all the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, Just to see if there's any extra info about the casting of Noah McDonald uh, as Honey Short. And I do see that the director apparently has Honey be a junior member of the NEP Recon who's looking for a promotion. Who's like trying to prove herself and all that stuff. I don't know. And um, the thing is she is a full-fledged member of the NEP Recon in the book. She is rank captain in the NEP Recon. Like I'm reading right here and apparently the actress did read the Anonymous Foul books when she was 10 years old. And I wonder if... um. This is why she's actually one of the uh, the actress like whose acting I actually liked in this movie. Like she de- she definitely did better than a lot of them. I feel like her character, even though it's not the honey we know from the books, is I feel like she tries to be more of the honey in the book, and it's because she's actually read the books. I wonder if that's why. Like I feel no bad because like obviously she's not the right fit for honey. Like physically. She's not old enough, nor does she have this right, like, look to her. She's not, like, and, like I, 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 I don't know. I feel like that's an, uh, another thing that really irks me is in the books, Honey is often described as beautiful. So it really sucks that when, like, kids who might have read that and been like, oh, this brown-skinned woman is seen as beautiful, if they have had any form of, like bullying over their skin color they have this like affirmation like no your skin is beautiful but they've taken that away by making her white so anybody like who could have related to that or had felt like some form of like confidence coming from that hey this brown skin lady is beautiful you just rip that away and let's make her white like, that's such a, it's a thing you need to show kids i mean like hey it's okay to be yourself you're beautiful <laughs> It, it it makes the whole changing Butner to be a black man even worse because, like, you've changed a Eurasian man, so you're getting rid of one minority, to a black man uh, who's a servant. And now you've changed the brown-skinned lady to a white-skinned lady. Not just a lady, white-skinned teenager. You also removed all the sexism aspect that she has to fight against, which is really, really important and a really good message to send to kids. I don't know, I guess kids can't handle uh, fighting against sexism in the workplace, I guess. And that is Honey Short and how they completely butchered her. Just one thing needs another, you change one aspect, like, hey, let's get rid of the sexism. Okay, what are, what's she fighting for now? Oh, let's prove herself because her dad's been disgraced. Yeah, that's gonna work. You know, one thing just needs to another, and, like, and then they do the whole dad thing, so she has this, like... Tra- like shared trauma yeah shared trauma with Artemis fell let's be instant friends Artemis and Holly were not friends in the first book I don't know the, the, everything they change about these characters really really screws over the next one like you know giving Artemis this like father trauma and let's give Holly father trauma too that way they become instant friends um Remove the sexism aspect. So what is she fighting for? Um, she's trying to prove herself. Um, okay. Uh, but why isn't she part of like the rest of the squad? Uh, let's make her this junior officer. They also never actually call her a junior officer in the movie. So how are we supposed to know that? That just looks like she's specifically being excluded from the rest of the officer's activities. Like, all these changes. I haven't even talked about how they instantly make her friends with Artemis when they realize they have shared daddy issues. They aren't friends until, like... I don't even think they would really be quantified as friends until maybe the fourth book. Because while in the second book, they do work together. 
And in the third book, they also work together. I guess maybe in the third book, you can quantify them as friends. They like you. You don't get you like you have some respect between the two of them, but you don't have friendship until later. Like it takes multiple books for them to actually form a friendship. You can't just make it like after being like kidnapped by him for like ten minutes and realizing they have daddy issues. Like that's not how friendship works. Ah, uh, but let's move on to the next fairy I'm going to talk about, which is Commander. Root. Commander Root, also known as Junius Root, which is his first name, uh, we first meet him through the thoughts of Honey. And at first he just... Oh, my AC just turned on. Oh, well, it's too hot. I'm going to keep going. We are first, like, introduced to him with Honey thinking of him as just another sexist elf that's just another sexist co-worker who is also her commander. Because he's always really hard on her, like... Like I mentioned before, she's five seconds late. He's he's on her ass and being like, hey, why are you late? Well, like, a sprite is walking in five seconds late. Like, huh? what, what's the difference between those two five seconds? There isn't. Except that she's an 80. Though, we quickly learn that the reason he's so hard on her is not because, like, he has a vendetta, vendetta against women or anything. No. It's because... He knows the council is going to be super hard on her, so he cannot risk her making a mistake, or that would screw it over for any other woman who's trying to make it in. Like, he is trying his best to make sure she does her best so other women have the chance to be where she's at. He's not necessarily doing it in the best way, because, like, you know, he is coming off as very, very sexist. But his heart's in the right place, which is more than you can say for a lot of her co workers. Like, he's not doing this to be malicious. He's doing this because he wants women to have the same opportunities that Honey has had. And that's so nice. Like, hey, there's a commander on your side. He's not necessarily doing it in the right way, but he at least he's on your side. And, like, yeah, like, this is a man who wants more women in, to be in NEP Recon. Good one for him. And, you know, it's something really nice about Commander Root is that he forms his, like, father-daughter bond with Honey throughout the books like you see a little bit in this one uh you see it more from his p- perspective than hers like she's still like oh this is my commanding officer who's kind of sexist towards me even after she e- even after she learns the reason why he's like this she's still like soup not she's not super buddy buddy with him but he is still like cares about her a lot to the point where when she is kidnapped by artemis he's the first one to jump into action like he could have sent any of his other officers to go search for her to follow the uh the no tracking signal that she has on her no he decides to do it himself he puts himself into the nine of action to find her because like this like he cares about his officers and he cares about honey he actually sees a lot of his former self in honey with like her hot headedness and just like jumping into actions he sees a lot of her, himself in her so he wants her to succeed it's a very, very nice story. He tries to do his best to get her out of the foul manner without causing any harm to her. Just like he, he's, he's like trying to pull strings with the council to give them more time. He to to give them the like the money so that they can pay for the ransom that he wants. Like he he talks to Artemis and being like he he's the one who talks to Artemis and is like, hey, give me back my officer. And I, he's really, really cool. And yeah, and um. In the movie, because I guess we're trying to be progressive or something. She's gender bent. Junius is no longer a guy commander, now a woman commander. Which is less progressive when you think about the fact that the original story was this like, anti-sexism story. Now you've removed that aspect, like... Mm-hmm. And because you've, like, cha- like, you've changed so much... Like, now it's Commander Root, who is baby- babying Honey. Like, she's all like, oh, you're so young. You don't have to go out there. Um, let's not mention that you're a junior officer so that the audience members actually understand why you're being excluded. Like, And she also just kind of stands around. She's not seen as a badass. She just stands and gives orders at the beginning. Um, doesn't a- jump into action like she she doesn't like oh let me pop on a suit and a pair of wings and go fly out and find out where honey is like he she doesn't do that like book root does and they don't even give her a first name which i just feel is lazy writing they could have just called her junie like come on junius junie what did people did you think they get her confused with juniette or something give her some completely random name you gave 
Hani's dad a name when he didn't have one in the book. Like, why can't you give Commander Root a name? They specifically make a joke about it when Mulch is like, oh, I don't even know your name. Which I'm assuming they're trying to poke fun at it or maybe like call back to the book readers who are like, haha, he, ha- he has a name in the book. She doesn't have a name in the movie. It's just lazy writing. Give her a name. Just give her a name. You, you, you... Because of everything that was changed, like the whole reason that Hani is kidnapped, the uh, the setup with the with the fact that the fairies already know about the fowls means that Commander Root doesn't have to actually jump into action to try to track her down through a tracking signal. No, they immediately know that's the fowls and they go to his house. Where is the action there? Where is Root jumping into action to save his officer? None of that is there. Like, you've stripped this guy of everything. Like, Judy Dench, like, get yourself a new agent. I know I'm stealing this joke from Dominic Noble, but get yourself a new agent. Like, you did not need to be in this role. You could have done so much better in uh, so many other roles. <sighs> but yeah. You know, changing, <laughs> changing a little bit, like, stripped command the root of all the action he actually has let's move on to the next fairy we're going to talk about which i've mentioned briefly much much diggums the dwarf <laughs> he's actually like he's, he, he's a really really cool character i love much much is such a cool character in the books like i have a friend whose online handle is actually a joke on much diggums he's so cool He's this kneptomaniac dwarf that cared so much more about riches and stealing and just money. And yeah, he cared more about that than magic. So he's like, okay, I'm going to give up my magic so I can continuously break and enter houses. Or specifically, dig and enter. (laughs) Like, he has no magic neft. Dwarves are not as magically inclined as other fairies are. Like, each fairy has slightly different... What's the word? Like specialties when it comes to magic? Some of them are more well-rounded. Like el- elves are pretty well-rounded in what magics they can use. Uh, they even have the elven warlocks. Uh, the extra house I mentioned earlier is like really, really powerful. But only a select few. Uh, I believe that centaurs have barely any magic at all. And similar to uh, dwarves, I think they can really only like heal themselves and maybe shield themselves they don't have a lot of magic and so he's like you know what? i'm just gonna give it up so i can live a knife in riches and you know he's lived a long life of crime he has this very like love hate relationship with the nap officers especially root as root was the first one to actually catch him in his crimes and the first one to actually arrest him uh I should have actually written down how many years he spent in prison after Root caught him. But they have, like, this really cool and little banter between the two of them. Because, like, hey, this is the guy who caught you. And, hey, this is the guy who, like, broke and entered into multiple human homes to steal stuff. Hey. He's really witty. He's really funny. Uh, the first, you're introduced to him when Honey's going to work and she passes by him. Uh, being like taken in because he's just been caught by an officer again it's a similar scene to what they have in the movie and except here like she's catching him pickpocketing the officer that's bringing him into the uh what's it called the police center yeah whatever and she's like hey officer your um your prisoner here is pickpocketing you and he's like what (laughs) in the movie they have him pickpocket holly instead i don't know why but like you know, he's actually one of the few characters that didn't differ too much in terms of characterization from the books to the movies. Like, I feel like he was fairly, like, accurate in a lot of aspects. Like, he's kind of witty. He has this banter between all of them. Um, I feel like it is played up a lot in the movie, but that might just be because it's Josh Gad. Like, honestly, Josh Gad wasn't the worst pick for this, uh, for this character. I wouldn't have minded if they haven't changed a few other things. Specifically, um, why is he giant? They made this huge deal, and it's a recurring joke throughout the entire movie, that he is known as a giant dwarf, 
a dwarfist giganticist of something. I don't know. And he makes a big deal being like, I'm not a dwarf. I'm a giant dwarf. I'm a giant dwarf. I want to be tiny like you. That's not a thing in the book. He's normal sized in the book. And they, I don't know if they did that because I'm like, oh, hey, Josh Dad is like, it's going to be hard to make tiny. Uh, what are we going to do? But he really isn't that big. And I wouldn't have minded if they fudged with the uh, with, with the heights a little. Because I understand that might be a little difficult uh, translating the fact that these uh, specific... Okay, so the elves were described to have adult human proportions, but at a child's height. And so, and uh, dwarves should be around the same height as them. Like, everybody is about three feet or shorter, except for the trolls. So it's like, it's not hard to like make these fully grown adults look three feet tall. So I wouldn't mind if they fudged it a little, but going around the route of him being this giant dwarf and making it a huge part of him, like you didn't, you didn't have to call attention to, to that. You could have just made it that dwarves are naturally that tall. You could have just used a little bit of CGI and a little bit of like movie magic to make him look a little shorter. You didn't, you didn't have to go around that route. Like, come on. If the Lord of the Rings could do that with the Hobbits, like you can do this with one character. Like, come on. And because they, like, do the whole, like, giant dwarf thing, it, like, takes away enough time they could have used to explain other things in the movie. Such as the fact that dwarves are, in fact, fairies. They don't actually explain this in the movie. At all. And it leaves the audience confused. I know that because I watched Swell Entertainment's video on this movie. She is a non-book reader. Amanda has never read the books, so she does not know that dwarves are fairies. I'm sorry, what was the point of like showing his ears to show the point of ears? Was that to show that he's like part dwarf, part fairy? I do not blame her at all for being confused as to why he's showing his pointy ears. Because everything in the movie has made it sound as if Mooch is not a fairy. They're like, oh hey. You know, Artemis said that no fairies are allowed into his home. Let's ma bring in Morch. So you're led to believe that, oh, dwarves, or at the very least, giant dwarves, are not fairies. But that's not the reason that he can dig into the home and the rest of them can't. The reason he can is because, like I mentioned before, he gave up his magic. He can enter a home without being hit with the same sickness that everybody else would. If Commander Root were to walk in there himself or send one of his officers in there, the second they cross this threshold, he will be hit with the magic sickness. They will get nauseous, they're gonna throw up everywhere. All of the magic's gonna leave the system and they'll be completely useless in there. So that's why Mulch is needed instead. Also, you're not gonna risk your officers permanently losing their magic to save one officer. Like, you're not gonna do that. But because this, is, this isn't explained in the whole, like, oh, let me show you my ears real quick. Like, that leaves people confused. Like, I don't blame Amanda at all. Also, go watch her video. It's actually super hilarious. I love her energy throughout the entire thing. I love her videos in general. So I was super excited when she decided to make a, a video on Artemis Fowl. It's amazing. Like, if you if you hate this movie as much as I do, you're going to love her tearing it apart. Also, yes, um dwarves in the books can unhinge their jaw and dig that's how they dig through dirt they eat it and then they shoot it out their butt i feel like it's kind of made more comical in the movie um i'm not sure if that's to appeal to children but they also messed up that aspect of it like they have the the dirt blow into one of the uh one of the elves that's standing by also um he's supposed to be a sprite if i remember correctly but whatever they don't include any sprites in the movie which makes it more confusing because now the same fairies to this room of complete elves. So you think elves are actually fairies and only elves? Anyway, back to Mulch. Um, they do this weird thing. It looks like he's just barely under the ground because you can actually see him tunneling through the ground. You shouldn't see that. He's actually like super far under the ground because he's trying to dig into the center of the house to break in. Uh, in the movie, they have him bust through a wall. Which you can clearly see is above ground because there's a window right by it that shows you above ground. Why is he underground and coming out through a wall? Did nobody notice this in the creation of this movie? Like director, writer, someone, someone 
Did no one think it was weird that he's digging into the ground and coming out of a wall that's above ground? The book had no issue with this because he was digging into a center. So that's just like, what was the point of including that aspect of him? Like, first you make it sound like he's not even a fairy. Next you do this weird digging thing where he comes out of a wall. Like, honestly, this isn't even a, a, a adaptation thing with in terms of character. This is more of an adaptation thing in terms of the story. But why the wall? And then, like, the last thing that really, really grinds my gears with Mulch is that they give him this magic nose and ear hair, which makes no sense. Because, first of all, um, if he has entered this house without permission, he should not be able to use magic. So why does he have magic hair in his ears and his nose? Why can it, like, magically grow out super long and he can use them as, like, tentacles, essentially, like, extra appendages to break into a safe? There seems to be a callback to the book in which Mulch breaks into one of Artemis' safes to find that he has a copy of the book, you know, the fairy Bible. The way Mulch does this is that his beard hair is actually... There's something to do with, like, the physiology... Physiology? Physiology? The physical aspect of a dwarf. The beard hair is not, like, normal hair. When you pluck it out, it will harden in the shape that it's in. So when he pokes his beard hair into the knock, he can actually make it take the shape of the key. He pulls it out, it hardens, and now he can turn the key and open the safe. That is how the dwarf hair works. It is not magic-based, it is biology-based, which is why it still works, even though he's lost his magic. It works in the book, it doesn't work in the movie, because he can't use magic once he's in that house, because he just broke one of the rules. And it's one of the rules they actually do mention in the movies. You know, if they had spent less time doing the whole giant dwarf thing, it wouldn't have been so confusing. Like, you caused so much unnecessary confusion in your audience. You did not need to do all of this when you could have just followed what happened in the book. But I don't know, I guess magic nose and ear hair is funny and it's for the kids or something. Also, like, he's also the narrator. I hadn't mentioned this before, but yeah, Mulch is the narrator. It makes no sense for him to be the narrator as there is an established narrator in the books. It's, um, Dr... Oh, shoot, I didn't actually write down his name. Huh, maybe because he didn't actually appear in the movie, so I didn't write down his name, so I only wrote down the people who were in the movie. But Dr. Argon is the narrator for the first book. He's actually the narrator for a few of the books, if I remember correctly. Uh, the books are set up in a way as if there's, like, this prologue that kind of sets up that, oh... These are people writing down what happened. Like, that's how it is. Um, there's something that happens in the very last book that's kind of really sad. Um, so there was an alternate narrator that could happen. So if you read the last book, you know who I'm talking about. And they could have gone with that person instead, who does appear in this book. If they didn't want to put in Dr. Argon for some reason, maybe they wanted to cut down on the number of characters. Like... They could have gone with this other person who's also an alternate narrator due to how the NAS book ends. You could have had this person narrate all of the movies. Since for some reason they decided to go with a narrator for the movies. But no, they go with Mulch. And the whole setup for this is he's taken to like MI6 to be interrogated as to what's going on. Because if I remember correctly, they're like foreign intelligence people. I forget what MI6 is. And like he's apparently telling him the whole story of what happened at the Fowl Manor. He's essentially revealing fairy society to them. And it's very dumb because the whole thing about fairies is they don't want humans to know about them. They are living and hiding because they don't exactly have the best relationship with humans. Humans drove fairies to live on the ground. They could not coexist correctly. And the fairies being more pacifist in general and... Ni- Due to the rules they live by, they went underground instead and they lived their life there. So why are they telling humans? Like, the plot of multiple books is to keep fairies from being exposed to the human race. Why is now him explaining the entirety of fairies to these people? And exp- like showing off his ear too. And like he's like, oh, you don't believe me? Look at my ear. Like, stop with the ear. <laughs> stop with the ear. Go away. Go away. But that is much, uh, that is the narrator for some reason. A poor kleptomaniac dwarf. You are so close to being book accurate. What they do to you. Uh, let's move on to the last fairy I'm going to talk about here. And that is Forney. Forney, Forney, Forney. 
He is a paranoid centaur. He is an incredibly intelligent paranoid centaur. It's this running joke that Folney has a connection of tinfoil hats that he uses regularly. He is teased about it, but he sticks by them because he believes that the CIA and the FBI and MI6 and every like intelligence agency out there is like scanning his brain waves, so he needs the tinfoil hats, which is really funny because he's actually the reason that humans have not found fairies yet. It's his technological advancements that have helped the fairies stay hidden for so many, so many centuries. But he still like thinks that the humans are spying on him. So it, it's really, it's really, he's such a funny character. He's also quite sassy. Like he's best friends with Holly. He's like one of the few people around who doesn't really judge her for being a woman. It, there's a nice little friendship there. He has this like nothing relationship with Ruth. They get along, but like. Rude will occasionally threaten to snatch his uh his, his budget and you don't you don't threaten Fulney's budget. <laughs> he also gets along with Mulch very well. Like it's a nice little friendly friendly little group there. They all love each other very much. It's this no like almost found family feel. Like he's just like this quirky, intelligent, paranoid centaur. We get none of that in the movie. He's barely in the movie. Like in the books, he's actually there at Foul Manor with the rest of the rescue squad for Hani, he's there to set up the time stop there in person he he's running all the technological stuff there in person here he's like no he's just in this giant like command center in the police station and he's just like shouting out like oh to turn on the time stop oh we're running out of time that like like we're, we're only at 50 percent like he does nothing like he actually has a lot of really deep conversations with multiple characters throughout this and they cut that on out because he's not there in person with them he's just this guy in the command center you get one scene where it shows him being friendly with holly which i guess is to show that they have a good relationship but you don't get this feel that they're best friends like you do in the book and he also doesn't have his iconic tinfoil hat like what the heck what's his tinfoil hat yeah there, there really wasn't much to this character and like i feel bad for the actor because he seemed like from what nero i saw like i feel like he would have been a really good phony like, he had that little, like, slightly sassy aspect of him. And, he, like, I feel like he could have really, like, if he had been given a chance, he could have really played paranoid, really funny. Like, I would have loved to see him be this paranoid, sassy, intelligent, like, tinfoil hat wearing centaur. Like, that would have been so cool. None of that. I hate these movies. I'm not really sure what else there is to say about Fulney. Uh, the... I don't know why they would lose this character so much from the book. Like, he's just not there. All of the meaningful conversation he has are just not there. I don't know if this is done because they are trying to, like, uh, pu- push the relationship between Commander Root and Hawley. Maybe that's why? I, I don't know. I really don't know. You have one semi meaningful conversation. Uh, I think, I think I'm. I'm trying. I'm, I might be. I might be giving them too much of the benefit of the doubt, or giving them too much credit. Uh, but yeah, like, I'm like, I'm not even sure what other changes they made to the characters that like, cause such a decrease in Foley's character. It, it's very, very odd to me. Like honestly, like I, they probably could have just like replaced this character completely, and I wouldn't have even noticed that that character is supposed to be Foley. Like, I could have been like, oh, maybe that's funny because, you know, he's doing the tech stuff. But, like, you've lost all the personality quirks. You've uh, lost all the conversation he has with other characters. Every relationship he had. Like, his inclusion to the story is so minimal. Because now he's not out there on the scene. He's not there at the foul manor trying to save Holly. Now he's in the comfort of the Noah elements. Like having ha- having this entire command center it's also like he doesn't have that giant command center in the books he actually has like this sono office where he does all his tech stuff but uh, whatever yeah and, like i think that's all i really have to say for these characters i'm looking at the recording right now and i'm at like an hour and i'm gonna edit this down 
but uh, I don't have enough time to talk about the Venons, who are also fairies. So, yeah, the Venons aren't going to be included in the fairy episode. Oopsie. Uh, I might also include a couple of side characters who are not Venons, but I just... I'm not going to be able to fit them into this episode without, like, dying while editing. So, they're going to be just pushed at the end of the Venons, just because, like, I'm talking about two characters. I'm going to have extra time. Yeah. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I hope you like my nail doodles too. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's it for me. Uh, stay safe, wear a mask, be healthy. Bye bye.